English is not so good. Uh, I have 11 kids. Shabbos uh, evening, uh, I couldn't go dance with my kids because it was a bad accident. So my wife told me, promise that in the morning, you take the kids and your grandkids, I have also grandkids, uh, to the synagogue to dance with them. I said, yeah, of course. Uh, 6.45 in the morning, uh, I get a call from the United States. I had an ambulance. And uh, they told me, drive the fastest you can to the south. Why? What happened? Go ahead. Yeah. This started in the morning. He lives in Petah Tikva, close to the airport here in the central part of the country. Uh, I drive to the, to the south, uh, to Shdelot, Kfaraza, Reim, with about the party there. Quarter to eight already, for, forgive me if it will be too graphic, so stop me if it's too hard for you to, to hear. Quarter to eight, uh, I was driving. I see what well, out the siren, was up nothing. You hear only a very strong whistle and a bomb five, 500 meters from you. The bomb falls and uh, kills two uh, soldiers. Well, one of them was, uh, the third one was, uh, was out two legs and uh, his left hand. I stopped the ambulance, I put the parts, I threw the bed out, I put the parts of the bodies uh, inside the ambulance. The person who was injured, I put uh, two uh, tourniquets on his leg and one on his hand. And I drove him to the hospital. On the way, I had to stop because he stop breathing, start working on him. When I got to the hospital in Brazilai, uh, I went inside the trauma room, I, went, I wanted to put him in bed. The, the, the doctor told me, don't waste my time, put him on the floor. He had his breathing. Don't waste my time, put him on the floor, that's pretty much things I can do. So, you can understand he was dead afterwards. I went back uh, to Kfaraza. On the way there, uh, it was something like nine o'clock in the morning. Uh, no soldiers, no police, no one knew what's happening. There were something like 200, 250 uh, bodies on the road, that's three kilometers. Young kids, and every one of them I saw my, my child, so I couldn't do, I couldn't continue, I had to stop. And I uh, put inside the ambulance something like 25 bodies inside the ambulance with kids, girls, <laughs> boys. And I continued driving, I did a U turn to go back to the pathology of uh, Bazilai. The way back, the side of the road, you couldn't see it from the road, but I couldn't go through the road because it was full of bodies, so I went on the sand. There was a pipe of electric that was disconnected to a lot of uh, fire on the way, so I had to go. On the side, I saw a taxi that uh, the driver was shot also in his head, and two girls behind, 20 something like, something like that. Was Holes also dead. I put him on the ambulance and I continued driving 35, 30 meters, 4 meters from there to a uh, fourth station of two uh, parents that were shot. So they were shot and in the back was a baby. One son, a year, or something like that, uh, was out of face, he was shot in his face, and he was stabbed with a knife from the butcher's, was stuck inside his, his head. So the parents had put him in the back, him I put him put in the back, so I took my uh, vest, and I, that's all I covered him, and I put him on my knees. I uh, 
I drove back to Tolajik. I put them there. It was hard for me to get up in the day because the kids were do nothing. The aliens approached like animals don't do things like that. Went back. because I went forwards and backwards. And uh, I saw a soldier that uh, was shot <coughs> with three bullets in his chest and uh, was without uh, two of his hands. And the terrorist chopped his hands. But I'm also in the ambulance. They continue to drive. Yeah, the stories that you hear, the movies that you see, the terrorists that did, it's 1% from what uh, was there. Like they shot the father, and afterwards they opened the stomach of the mother. It's true. The story is true because I saw it. Yeah, yeah, I saw it. Uh, Zaka came three days only after it began, so they got the stuff that they couldn't deal with. We had to save life. We saw terrible things. Uh, took a girl that uh, was five years old, seven years old, like my daughter. After she got killed, the uh, terrorist <laughs> cut, chopped her, and put her like a puzzle with uh, metals of the barbecue. Oh and I picked it up, so it fell apart. I had to get my shirt for it because then when other people s should suffer, that's what I saw. What hurts me is uh, that uh, I know I saved maybe 200, 250 people, but I, did, I know I didn't do enough. Because if I was brought up with a Zionist family, the soldier, if you don't leave people in the back, and if you, th you have time to drink, Means you had time to save other people. And if I stuck 25 people inside the ambulance, maybe I could squash another 10 people in the ambulance. I can give myself an answer that I did my best. But it isn't like that, it's thing like that. Do your best because you have to save more. If it comes to life, it's not money. It's not time to say, you know, we will blow up. Time is money. No. Time is not money, time is life. It's not a war, it's a holocaust. Because they treated also people, Christian people, from Thailand, they treated also Muslim people, from Rat, the whole family that they saved, they were to harm. Uh, I know that uh, People would say I'm a hero. It's not true. I'm a small person. I look to every person as my child, as my brother. And I came to save him. I wish I could do more. I remember that I hold a soldier. The only thing he wanted was to die alone. He knew he was going to die because he had a bullet in set his throat, it was hard for him to, to breathe, uh, and he had only half of his body because his two legs and his chair was cut off, so <coughs> he couldn't survive, and he asked for me, the only favor he wanted me is to hug him, he doesn't want to die alone.
remember I was driving an ambulance. Uh, I saw a jeep, a white jeep coming in front of me, going along the road. So I stopped them because I didn't know if it's a terrorist or an Israeli. Then I saw soldiers, but I knew that also uh, the Arabs, the terrorists, were masked. They looked like soldiers, but they weren't soldiers. So I stopped and I went carefully because I already got shot from uh, uh, terrorists. So I went slowly, slowly, and I saw a soldier with his head on the wheel. It was uh, a trauma. I didn't know what's going around him. In the back was two uh, dead soldiers with masks, ski masks, because uh, they were from a very uh, secret uh, unit. So I tried to wake him up. I was pressing strong next to his neck. He didn't answer, so I gave him a slap and I uh, told him uh, the Thomas commander giving him an order to go out from, his, from the car. I asked him why they're here, so he said, because he got, he got an order from his captain that he has to bring these two soldiers that were killed to the pathologic in Brazilai, that the rabbi should sign on them. He have to recognize them by him, and they have to bury them without no one should know that they got killed because they are in a very secret unit. Not uh, civilians, no. Uh, the army, no one should know that they are dead. And then, again, he's like a robot. Let them listen, let them hear. So I told him, again, it's an order. He helped me to take them out, put them in the back of the ambulance. And we started to drive. The soldier tried to open the door of the ambulance to jump. So I stopped the ambulance again. And I slapped him again. I told him, look, I guess you're forgetting. I'm your commander, but now I'm also your father. He was an American from, uh, I think, from Florida. Uh, he came to volunteer to the army here. It's a very heavy accent. Told him, uh, I'm not going to move the, the ambulance if you don't phone your parents now. Now is the time to cry. When you get back to the unit, everybody will salute you. When you get back home, everybody will hug you and kiss you and say you're a hero. But now is the time to cry. If not, not moving the ambulance. So he phoned his mother. He was crying, yeah, I was crying with him together all the way. Only thing he told his, his mother that he's done and he can't take it anymore. When I got to the pathologic, so I told him, you stand outside the ambulance, you know, no, don't let no one go close to the ambulance, I'm going to look for the rabbi. I went inside, I said it's a miracle, he, went in, he didn't go inside because he would shoot himself and also other people there. It was, it was full of bodies until the ceiling. Soldiers, kids, parents, grandparents, old people, young people were mixed. Parts of bodies went back, called the rabbi, I told him to come outside because there's a soldier that needs you. He came outside and I told the soldier, okay now, give him the details. He said, I'm not allowed. So I told him, it's an order. Give him the details, if not, we can't bury them. <laughs> I said, well, we'll see you give him the details. I'm not allowed to give the details. So I said, okay, I'm leaving you here with the bodies and I'm going. So, he said to say, he said the names, who are the people, collapsed because I wasn't allowed to hear the, the people who got killed, also the rabbi. I told the rabbi, I didn't bring him here. I don't want to know nothing. And the rabbi signed, he gave us a <clears throat> paper that we are allowed to bury them. Now we have to bring him back. He wants to go continue fight to the to the war. Told 
when you come to go back. So he said, if you're going to bring me back, I'll kill you. I want to go back to my unit. So I told him, okay, put him on the phone, put the captain on the phone. Took the captain, I went outside the ambulance, and told the captain, look, if he goes back to the unit, he will kill you also. He will kill all the soldiers there because it's PTSD. It's, he, can't, he can't go back. <clears throat> From zero to 10, he asked me, 11. This person is, is done. So he told me, okay, you have 20 minutes to bring him back to the field, putting down a helicopter of 669. But the bodies will take him also. I said, okay. But I'm not going to be in there in 20 minutes. <laughs> You're not there in 20 minutes. I said, better if you shoot him, you shouldn't kill someone else. 20 minutes, they're not there. I was uh, driving back. I got there less than 20 minutes. I was in the language, I was driving like a maniac, no stops, no red lights. I got to the place, two soldiers jumped on him. He didn't help, he put them on the floor because he understood that we tricked him. He put them on the floor, and he said, I'm going to kill them if you don't put me back in the unit. So four people jumped on him, put them down, and the doctor put the needle inside his neck. After 10 seconds, he was asleep. They took him. I went, I went back, I went back to uh, Naim for the uh, Nova, where people were dancing only a few hours before. And I saw a, a girl, I should I find her? Or at least find a family. I don't know if she survived, but didn't survive. Uh, she had, uh, she almost had the left leg and uh, part of her hand. I uh, put uh, two tourniquets on her. And she only, the only thing she asked, she wants to talk with her parents. She said, well, she know that she's dead. Sorry, I went to the drama room. You couldn't see the floor really. It was full of blood. Uh, I understood from the doctor that uh, she was survived. I'm not a person of uh, talking about money or politics. I know all of you are hugging you know, that's all and looking after. Jewish people in Israel. But I can ask for you only for two things. As one is uh, to pass it on to all the people in the States. You should know that uh, it's not a war, it's a Holocaust. People are going through a Holocaust here. Horrible things that we don't see, not in the videos, not in the YouTube, not in the Telegram or about the terrorists and also it's one percent of the truth the truth of what happened there if i could uh, open my heart or my brain that people should see what i saw there i can say only one thing i could be only 20 minutes at home i went away but i didn't want to hurt my wife and kids i can't hug my wife and kids i can't go close to them I have the smell of blood and taste of bodies inside my mouth and my nose already for months. So I prefer not to hurt them. And after the war, I guess I have, I'll have a treatment to go back to be normal. Well, I can, but uh, hopefully. And the second thing I can ask from you is how much you helped United at Solar with ambulances. I know that if we would have more ambulances, more motorcycles, it's no more money. It's more people alive. It's saving his life. I'm a 
I'm a little person. I, I don't work. I'm already uh, in pension. I gave 27 years of my life to the country. And today, I give my life for saving life of people 24-7 in United Tzolah. I don't do favors to United Tzolah. United Tzolah does me a favor that they gave me this chus uh, to save people's life. More ambulances, more motorcycles, is saving more life. And, uh, like I told the rabbi before, I met not once, not twice, but my katim. I went with my parents to Shagat Zion. Uh, he was a holy person. He loved every Jew. He hugged every person. And he helped also a lot of people. Or personally, people that the Rabbi Katim helped me to save him. <coughs> I said, You know that song is my family. You know that song is for saving life. And if I could give a dollar and every dollar that you give, I would sell my house for it also. Because I know, I know how much it's important and how much it hurts me today that I wish I could, I would have a truck or a big ambulance to save more people this time. And again, I'm sorry if I make you upset. The story that I told you. So, um, it's, there's nothing else I, I could ever say to follow that up. I and mean, just, uh, we thank you for coming. Please take the information you have with you.